Good evening. This is Mae Russell, and it's KAZU-FM in Pacific Grove, California. We put on the card here to have the, uh, there's a tape recording that we put on, put on last week, to take responsibility for the broadcast. Uh, the card operation isn't working here, so I will repeat what I said before. The station KAZU is not responsible for the, any of the material that I put on the air. That is May Brussels' responsibility, and I stand by the things that I've said and uh, take that totally, 100%. There is no one responsible for the things that I say. Briefly, uh, continuing with the idea of recuperating what happened a year ago tonight because the year goes so quickly, November the 15th, 1981, I was on the air. Uh, this is program. 519 just a year ago, and I was talking about E. Howard Hunt being on the airplane that I was on coming up from L.A. Uh, he was had a top-secret meeting, top-level meeting of the CIA out at Pebble Beach that week. Uh, Ronald Reagan's uh, Congress, is, Jimmy Carter's Congress, was covering up Jonestown. There was an inquiry to begin. The Jonestown inquiry was canceled by the House of Representatives in 1981, November 5, 1981, the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on International Operations uh, has canceled their hearings on Jonestown. If we would get into those thoroughly, we could prevent future things uh, like that taking place. But obviously, the ifs are more than the facts. And these uh, Jonestowns will take place. And this was not investigated and involved the CIA. I talked some more on the Medfly connections that it would uproot Jerry Brown. And that was the beginning of the smearing of Jerry Brown so that he could not successfully become senator and Pete Wilson from San Diego would represent California in Congress. That's what Ronald Reagan wanted. He said, don't send anybody but Pete Wilson. And so now he has Pete Wilson. Um, I mentioned that Ronald Reagan would have to declare some kind of a national war or Reichstag emergency to get himself into control of the country that I was waiting for some kind of internal operation to take place and in a few minutes a little while i'm going to talk about the murder up in oroville california of joe hoover and the uh, possible chance to try to get charles manson out of jail and this could have been another kind of continuation of the tylenol reichstag operation to get more police and surveillance similar identical to the manson family and the sla terrorism that took place before this had the seeds of that kind of operation, but might have been nipped in the bud by the necessary murder of Joe Hoover breaking the story uh, before the accident or the murder took place of uh, maybe primary witnesses in the escape of Charles Manson out of Vacaville. A murder, I should say there were many. He had inflammable material in the attic of the chapel that he had access to and could have started a fire as they had in the Mississippi jail or an incident that took place in New Mexico that was never solved. Uh, I was talking about that kind of operation that Ronald Reagan is good at, and with Mr. Meese and Mr. Jenner and the California team in the White House, they would be able to pull that. Of course, a lot has happened in the past year, and he's got more important things to take care of, but I still think they had this option in the bud that was nipped in the bud this past week, and we'll go into that in detail. I referred to uh, General MacArthur in the book, The American Caesar, written by William Manchester, and that Colonel Charles Willoughby, the head of the United States intelligence through the whole war in the South Pacific, was actually Carl Wiedenbach, a German, a Teutonic, who was running our operation in the Pacific as Fritz Kramer, the German, the IG Farben family, was running our uh, winding up the war and bringing the war criminals to this country, releasing them from prison and making a protege of Henry Kissinger and later Alexander Haig in uh, dominating foreign policy long after the war was over. We had Fritz Kramer, a German, taking care of the European division, and there was Karl Wiedenbach, who changed his name, who was taking care of the Pacific and actually closing it on the American Constitution as we know it and our liberties and taking hold of our government agencies even at that time. I was talking about those things just a year ago. Now, I'll go back to some more, a lot more on DeLorean in the next few weeks. Next week is the 20th anniversary since the murder of John Kennedy, so we won't update too much about DeLorean except a few comments, but I did want to talk about some very important deaths that took place this week and some stories, update a few stories that are primary, and I do want to share them with you right now. That war memorial uh, of for the Vietnamese veterans was very impressive. I saw and watched very closely the controversy of 
that particular design and how they tried to change it. And the artist who won by a fair competition kept it as it was. And the reading off the names for a continuous roll call was very effective in the church, saluting the veterans and reading continuously for three or four days the name of every person engraved into that marble. It was a very impressive document. Standing in front of that um, dedication was a Vietnam veteran by the name Glenn Sinclair, and he was yelling at the officials from the VA that were there, and he got up and spoke, and he said, I have five children ranging in age from 1 to 12. All were born with birth defects that he attributed to herbicide. Our people over there did this to us. I want them to know. I want to know what to tell my kids when they get married. Can they have kids? I want to know what to tell my wife. We don't trust you. And he accused the VA, rightly so, of covering up for a long, long time the information on Agent Orange. And then they were forced to say, well, maybe in the next three or four years we'll find a link. It was a very uh, beautiful design. I would like to improve on the design, although I'm not an architectural student. Uh, I drew my own design of a memorial to the Vietnam War. Maybe if, if it works and I get a contract, I'll be asked to design some more. What I would do is take the original design that she has, or that V with the marble on it, and the name of the Vietnam veterans, and I would have uh, five or six other pieces of marble spreading out so it would be look like a sunshine, like a ray of sun over that field of grass. And on one of those spokes, I would list, instead of the men who died, every government contractor who made a million or more off the Vietnam War and made maybe 10 million more off of the Central American War and maybe of the Middle East War increased a tenfold or a 100%. Uh, put names like General Dynamics and what they had in 1954 and what they had at the end of the Vietnam War, or Litton Industry, or Use Aircraft, or Boeing, and take all the multinational corporations, Bell Helicopter, and put the figures there of what these contractors had and identify them by name. Who made the cement? Who made the tiger cages? Who got the contracts? Like Brown and Root may build the tiger cages or send over the cement. And uh, Lady Bird Johnson was a, a large stockholder, or is, in Brown and Root. Put the companies that, that made money off of the war and let the American people who, see, who died there see who made there. I think that's fair because some are dead and others are still making. And then I would have a list of the generals in charge, the CIA people and the chief of staff, who was promoted and which military people etched in marble uh, made the herbicide, the Dow chemical, that would be under contracts. We should remember for all times those people that ha carried on that war, like Henry Kissinger, and you might even in marble on that long piece, put what he did with the bombings in Cambodia and Laos and uh, have a one branch going out of the people who ran the war and uh, besides those that made profit. And then another spoke of this sun, you see on the grass is, is the uh, beautiful piece of lawn, and then the spokes come out. I would put a piece of marble and put all the suicides. I understand that there are more people commit suicide since the war than were killed in battle over Vietnam. So I think we should etch in marble every Vietnam veteran and person who was over in the Southeast Asia War who commit suicide and put it on that smoke, spoke. And then have a list of everybody who went to prison who served in Vietnam, who came home needing her own cocaine um, and hashish, was doped out of their heads, became uh, drug addicted, had to rob and steal, and uh, did murders, went crazy. Last week there were several murders of Vietnam veterans who went berserk. One who put on his battlefield clothes and relived a battle and went crazy. And one you know, driving through windows and killing themselves uh, and having others going to prison. There were several in the news last week. So let's have the prisoners on one of the spokes. And then those that went to mental hospitals, that's another one. I'd put another piece of marble there and etch every person who served in Vietnam or didn't go to Vietnam, resisted the war and was put in a prison or mental hospital who was given LSD a la Timothy Leary and the CIA, it was handed out, who went crazy. Everyone who has a mental history dating back to that period, whether they fought or stayed home and was given the MK Ultra treatment, they should be etched in marble. And then everybody who is sick or whose child has a birth defect, those people, uh, the cleft palates, the club feet, the spina bifidas, um, the 
diarrhea of the children, there's a whole lot of them that are suffering. And I think the diseases caused by that war and the chemicals, the names of the chemicals and the chemical companies, because that's a little different than the generals. We have the Dow chemical and the corporations, but maybe etch and marble what the effect of their actual chemicals do to people. And then I think you should etch and marble the news media people that carried the war, whether it's Mr. Cronkite or Dan Rather or CBS or NBC or Daniel Shore, the people who sold us the war with our evening news and dinner, and then when it was all over, they called it a fiasco. Uh, the news media, the press conferences, who conducted the stories at home, knowing the bombings were going on over in Cambodia and lying to us, uh, let's see who tells the story of Vietnam and glorifies that event. I think it's very effective to see the list of people who died there, but I just did a little, little sculpture and thought I'd share it with you because there's a little more needed. Those who died is not the whole story of Vietnam. The profits, the corporations, the medicine, the mental sicknesses, the genetic defects, the horrors, the basket cases. Do you know how many basket cases there are? I was once told by a nurse up in Wyoming, people like Johnny Get Your Gun without arms and legs that are secreted away. And now they've tried suicide, uh, various ways, biting their tongue, holding their breath. Do you know the basket cases that came home? Uh, this has never been investigated. I think we'd go into that. Then following the Vietnam Memorial or simultaneously, there was the change of governments in the Soviet Union, and Mr. Brezhnev passed away. I stayed up till 3 this morning watching the funeral. It was fascinating to watch, and it's very sober, somber. It's a, uh, it was a good experience for me, a little tired today, but there was a change of guard there. And finally, finally, Ronald Reagan met his match in the new succession of powder. Mr. Andropov, can you imagine him standing up eyeball to eyeball with Ronald Reagan. I mean, the uh, imagery is so fantastic because one has been groomed with the lollipops of balloons holding his hand out of the helicopter, the ho, 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 I'm so happy, but I won't answer your questions. Where's my card, you know? And a man that has been nothing but a front for General Electric, for the Screen Actors Guild, for Right Wing, for the great gung-ho. He wouldn't fight in a war, but he'll sell you the war, sell you the defense contractors, the cost overruns. Now he's president of the United States and he has to deal Mr. Big Mouth who wanted war within two days of his inauguration. I mean, he didn't accept his presidency gracefully. It was uh, a big brahu, the entire staff. They were going to meet the Soviet Union head on and Mr. Brezhnev kept them out of World War Three. There were many times the last two years where the Reagan administration would have gone gung-ho and wanted it. He kept them out and us out of World War III. But now we have the head of the KGB, and he's the president of the Soviet Union. And don't take that lightly. If I can get on the air and talk to you about Robert Vesco and the Nugent Bank and Mr. Alfred Bloomingdale and the kinky sex of the White House gang and more... And you think of all the habits of the dope dealing and the discussions. There's an article this week about the Nugent Hand Bank in Australia. Here's our Vice President Bush over there at the funeral. It was linked to heroin and cocaine dealing and assassinations in America and in Washington, D.C., and banks collapsing and hidden funds, you know, scrounging around for money. We keep hearing how bad the economy is in the Soviet Union, but we have a can of worms linked to the crime syndicate, to Murder Incorporated, and Ronald Reagan's career was an on-camera event, and now he has to meet a man who knows everything, the eyes and ears of the world. Those Russian candidates aren't very photogenic. They're somewhat even almost ugly to American standards, but they're just like granite. You see their faces in the Soviet Union. They had a five-minute silence at the funeral for every single person in the Soviet Union. I don't think America could stay still for five minutes. Uh, the young people did it for John Lennon, but that's that's it. I mean, they haven't stood still since, and they never will again. But here is a situation where Ronald Reagan has met a man who knows everything. And one of the interesting comments, he, one of the first things he said uh, after this uh, uh, funeral and after the death, and he has Mr. Andropov to meet. He made a statement, well, the, we will get along, we'll try to get along. He said it takes two to tango, and he's willing to try it. Well, he'll do plenty of dancing. There's a lot of tango going on. President Reagan says it takes two to tango. Believe me, he'll tango. And simultaneously with the death of Brezhnev, 
Mr. Wallace's out, but he's a different Wallace than went in. As he said in the paper, in my future conduct, I will be courageous but also prudent. What he didn't say is that the $22 billion that went from the CIA and the Infobel and the CIO and the Roberta Calvi money and the Vatican money has dried up. He can't do anything without that CIA Vatican money, and the Vatican has to come up with $1.2 billion of notes it promised on Panamanian fronts. So Wallace well, is a much more humble person. They can afford to let him out the same day that uh, there's a new uh, administration, the Soviet Union, as if the first one wasn't tough enough, because they know what Wallace well, is. They know where he got his money from, and he will be not quite as aggressive. You need a lot of millions to carry on the kind of activity he did for two years. And when the fund dries up, you see changes in their demeanor. And Mr. Wallace is going to tone down, you better believe. And the Soviet Union holds all the Trump cards. Why do they hold them? Because Marina Oswald came from the Soviet Union and from a czar's family. And Lee Harvey Oswald was in Navy intelligence. And they know who Lee Harvey Oswald saw in the Soviet embassy in Moscow, and Mr. John, Mr. McVicker and Snyder and, and Priscilla Johnson, and they know who Mr. Zeiger, the radio factory uh, that worked with Oswald, they know who sent him from Argentina. This uh, new administration with the head of the KGB knows everything about what we've done in this country for 20 years. So I think you're going to see things toned down because I've always said that the world is run by bullets and blackmail. And certainly the KGB will will have the goods on everything that has happened to our uh, administration for the past 20 years, going back to John Kennedy, if not before. Now, another death uh, that was not quite cataclysmic, but very interesting in terms of her influence over her husband was Mrs. Begin. Eliza Begin died in the obituary of the paper, in the newspaper, talking about her. Begin's wife dies in Jerusalem. He rushes home. And it tells the story of how he met her. Uh, it's in the biography of Begin. To the outsider, it's unclear how far her influence extends, but it is known that her husband consulted her on his every move. They met when they were too young to get married. He, she had a twin sister, and he decided which one he wanted to marry. But then the uh, article on her death said that the Arnold family was in Drovich. I can't pronounce that right. The Polish city, D-R-O-H-O-V-I-C-Z, Drohovitz, D-R-O-H-O-V-I-C-Z. And they were working as leaders in Poland for the right-wing Betar Zionist youth movement. And when they married, they were married May 29th. That's my birthday and John Kennedy's and a lot of others wearing their brown shirt Betar uniform. So that's time to translate for you what the right wing movement was of the Begins and what the brown shirt uniform was. And uh, I got some articles from New York from listeners to World Watch. And one of the best that I've referred to just briefly came out of the Village Voice. Um, this was published. Uh, Mr. Coburn did this August the 10th, 1982. It was on the background of Begin, where he came from. And this is important because of the massacres and the deaths that took place recently in Lebanon to understand Mr. Begin and the American government perfectly. This article uh, from the Village Voice says, The polls show support for Israel has mounted during the media news story of the Beirut bombings. The Israelis methodically destroyed West Beirut without undue commotion. Anywhere, apparently, in the United States, similar to Nazi bombings of Coventry, 500, uh, but Beirut surpassed those 500 more. No opposing force, just bombing. Now, in 1948, December the 4th, in the New York Times, Albert Einstein and Hannah Arendt and others wrote a, an article, a letter to the editor in the New York Times, 1948, to the editor, among the most disturbing political phenomena of our time is the emergence of the newly created state of Israel of the Freedom Party, the T Tanat Harut, T-N-U-A-T, H-A-H-E-R-U-T. This party is closely akin and in organization and methods and political philosophy and social appeal to Nazi and fascist parties. It was formed out of membership and following the Irgun Zvi Lumi, Z-V-I, Z-V-A-I, in other words, L-E-U-M-I. It's a terrorist right-wing chauvinist organization in Palestine 
The current head of it is Menachem Begin. This is 1948, uh, the leader of that party, and he gives the impression for American support that it's calculated for the Israeli elections. He wants to cement ties with a conservative Zionist element in the United States, which he certainly did. Before irreparable damage is done, Einstein said, by way of financial contributions in Begin's behalf and the creation of Palestine, study the fact that a large segment of America supports fascist elements in Israel. The American public must be informed to the record and the objectives of Mr. Begin and his movement. And then the article goes on, the public avowals of Begin's party are no guide to its actual character. And he gives an example, a shocking example of how they're attacking the villages, you know, the current terrorist activity. And how it goes back, the massacres, to his early training. And Albert Einstein was warning that the early training of Menachem Begin goes to the Brown Church to Mussolini's uh, operation in Italy. And he worked with Mussolini and the Brown Church. He was one of the most dangerous men. And the people working with him approved of what he was doing in Germany and in Italy during the forming of the fascist parties. Einstein, according to uh, Mr. Coburn, the village voice, or any well-informed person could study the financial director of the revisionist movement. That was Begin's group, Wolfgang von Wiesel, W-E-I-S-E-L, a good friend of Begin's, who in June 12, 1936, said that he personally was a supporter of fascism. He rejoiced at the victory of fascist Italy and Abyssinia as a triumph of the white races against the black. The revisionists were the most military-minded, and they carried on with the Irgun. They formed the Irgun. They trained in Poland at Zakopane, Z-A-K-O-P-A-N-E, by the anti-Semitic Polish army, taught Pagan, the anti-Semitic army in Poland, and that's where he met his wife and chose between one of two twin sisters. He taught them how to fight and trained the revisionists and told the Jews of Poland that was Begin's role as a young man. Don't resist fascism in Poland. Don't resist it. And he appeased them and told them not nothing to worry about. Then he skips when the Nazis come into Poland, full swing, he escapes at, from Warsaw and ends up in Palestine. He spends a little time in the Soviet Union in a prison camp and because they were probably on to his murderous ways and his training with Mussolini in the brown shirts in Italy. They had a they wore a brown shirt. This is the group that he had that's described in the village voice. They had brown shirt uniforms. They had naval training in Civita Vecchia, V E C C H I A from nineteen thirty four to nineteen thirty seven. It was set up by Mussolini. In nineteen thirty six, the revisionist cadets known as the Batarum were reviewed by Il Duce himself in March of nineteen thirty six. They described the review of Il Duce and the approval of him. The revisionist leader, Vladimir Jabotinsky, J-A-B-O-T-I-N-S-K-Y, deliberately stressed it had not been necessary to have the school in Mussolini's Italy, but they made it as a matter of choice. They wanted to work in Mussolini's Italy. They praised the Italians for going after the blacks in Ethiopia. They were given permission to... Uh, training for terrorism on how to bomb and so forth in Poland by the anti-Semitic government. That's where he learned his terrorism so that future Nazis, I suppose, could take Palestine away from the British and call it Israel. And that is the origin of the power of Mr. Begin and how he can do the things that he is doing. Now, he went back to Israel for the funeral of his wife. I think the funeral was today. They're both married in their brown shirts. But he will come back and see Ronald Reagan. He has asked for several billion dollars, not in loans, in gifts this week. The American government is to give him. He has offered that country uh, a fascist base that he can have, uh, they can have to uh, militarily to go against the Soviet Union. It'll be, Israel will be a military base, and that's all it was ever meant to be. Also, an article from the LA Times recently, Begin offers the battlefield data to the United States. Missile destroying invention, secret report included. So he has weapons that are so valuable, and maybe you saw some of them on television during the battle, the missiles and so forth. He will give these secret weapons to the United States or sell them for the money that is uh, 
uh, we're going to give him. Begin is an extension of the brown shirts of the fascist Hitler Nazi group. He will get everything he wants, and Israel becomes, as I say, a military base. Even the spotlight, which is, well, I shouldn't say even, the anti-Semitic far-right newspaper, which is opposed, say, to the so-called liberal village voice, has an article, Terrorist Life from Menachem Begin, and they tell about how Menachem Begin was used to kill British soldiers at the same time Nazi Germany was killing British soldiers, how the establishment press is not interested in the paradox, how Begin defended his actions and bombed the King David Hotel July 22, 1946, where 97 nurses and soldiers and British and Arab civilian employees were killed and hundreds maimed. And this goes into how Begin, the, the spotlight has the story, Begin deserted the British Army in 1944 and joined the Aragon, which was anti-British, and uh, worked with them and was collaborating with Nazi Germans from 1940 to 44, killing British soldiers and working with the Germans in Palestine and setting up and receiving his license to exterminate Arabs in the future who got in the way of the power structure. Uh, the non-Christian Muslims, uh, Begin was allowed to wipe them up to go into the villages. Uh, Begin has had the approval for his massacres for a long time. Another article from the People's World has a list of statistics, Israel arms flow to fascism. And it tells about money going down to Guatemala, to the dictator down in Guatemala, money to El Salvador, to the Honduras, to Chile, to Argentine, Bolivia, and Haiti, that they export a billion dollars a year to fascist countries down in Central and South America. Israel loaned El Salvador $21 million from its U.S. aid allocation at Ronald Reagan's administration request. See, Begin will come and say, I want... Uh, say two billion. I have the article at home. I didn't bring it. I want two billion. Ronald Reagan will give him the two billion. Then Begin will give it down to El Salvador. That way, the CIA is not funding El Salvador. How with they have so little money after that uh, expensive war in uh, Lebanon, and yet they send money overseas to Africa, South Africa, Guatemala, wiping out the Indian villages and working in all of these fascist countries, Israel is pouring money into Central America. Begin went to Los Angeles this week to ask money of the Jewish community to give to Israel. The Jewish community may just as well write a check to the president of El Salvador and Guatemala and the uh, CIA in Nicaragua. Write your check to them because that's where it goes. And don't have any delusions. If you're going to do this thing, do it right. That's, that's the truth. That's where it goes. Now, that war in the Middle East, there's just two short articles in one minute before we take a break and continue with the second half of this broadcast. An article from the Washington Post, this was March 17th, the war in Iraq is costing $1 billion monthly. They have to cut back their economic plans because 18 months of gun and some butter in Iraq has affected the economy a little bit. $1 billion a month Iraq spends to fight Iran. And another article, Iraq won't buy 12,000 cars that are defective from Ottawa, Canada. Iraq said they rejected a shipment of 12,000 Canadian-built Chevrolet Malibus because they're defective. The Iraq government gave $100 million to General Motors because they give the cars to the bereaved families of the Iraqi war dead. You think these are natives out there fighting and they're buying cars from General Motors and they said the cars they got uh, didn't work. They were faulty. The transmissions didn't work and they wanted different cars so they're going to transfer the order. But the bereaved families who lose a member into the Iraq-Iranian war get a General Motors car and uh, they stopped the order until they were fixed up. So they were buying $100 million dollars worth of cars for the bereaved members and spending a billion uh, in that just short time period over there. War is business. That's why I say I want to design the war memorial of who gets the business, General Motors or whatever. Now we're going to take a one-minute break and then continue with this broadcast.